Hi, everyone. Welcome to our final in-person event of Wayward 2022. Thank you so much for being here. The Wayward changes its focus every year, um, but we always have a Nan Shepherd event. Um, and sometimes it's looking specifically at Shepherd's life and work. Sometimes, as tonight, it's looking at work which follows in one way or another in the tradition of Shepherd's writing. I'm joined tonight by Sarah Thomas and Esther Wolfson, who've written very different works of nature writing, um, but both are strikingly beautiful books. I think books that you will all, if you haven't read them yet, you will all really appreciate. Um, I'm delighted to be here. My name's Tim Baker. I teach in the English program at the University of Aberdeen, and I'm joined over here by Leslie Creer, our BSL interpreter. And just to give you a quick rundown of what's going to happen over the next hour, we're going to start out with readings from Sarah and from Esther, um, little bits of their book to give you an insight into to some of their themes, some of their style. Um, then the three of us will have a conversation, and then we'll open it up to you for any sort of questions or comments you might have. And the those of you who have been here all week will be very familiar with this sort of format, but it will change at the final moment. Um, we'll be talking amongst ourselves until about 20 past the hour, at which point we will then invite Dr. Helen Lynch up, who will um, announce the winners of our Nan Shepherd writing competition for S5 and S6 students, which I will also say a few words about. Um, and then it's Half past, Leslie will disappear, um, but Dr. Lynch and the team might say some thank yous because it has been a long, if very exciting week. Um, and at that point, we will have a book signing in the back as well. So that's roughly what we're doing, um, just by word of introduction. So firstly, to introduce Sarah Thomas, who is a writer and filmmaker. She was the 2020 Arts Foundation Environmental Writing Award winner. She was long listed for the Nan Shepherd Prize. You see what we did there. Nan Shepherd just filtered through all of this stuff, um, as well as being shortlisted for the Fitzcarraldo Essay Prize, which is probably my favorite prize. And it's one of those ones where everyone on the shortlist is just as good as the winner. Um, and her new book is The Raven's Nest, which is a memoir about life in Iceland and is very good. Um, and then after that, we'll be hearing from Esther Wolfson, who, who is has been a guest, I don't know if at Wayward before, but certainly at Word, we, we, we definitely talked there. Um, Esther is a resident of Aberdeen, is the author of Corvus and Field Notes from a Hitty, Hidden City, um, which was shortlisted for the Wainwright Prize and the RSL and Dachi Prize. Um, she is an honorary fellow in the archeology span department here at the University of Aberdeen, as well as being a former artist in residence. And her new book is called between light and shadow, and again, is brilliant. And I'm not just saying this. These are genuinely really good books. Um, so we're going to hear a little bit from both, and then we will chat. So Sarah, if you want to start us. I just, I just want to say I was not the winner of the uh, Environmental Writing Award. That would, I was nominated for it. Just want to clear the record there. <laughs> um, <clears throat> So I'm going to read an extract from The Raven's Nest, which is a, um, I'm calling it an ecological memoir um, because it's, it's written in a many threaded way, which I've woven together in the shape of a nest of the title. Um, and it, it details the period of my life spent living in Iceland's West Fjords, which is an incredibly striking landscape uh, where you, you can't but feel completely continuous and part of nature. Um, and at stake in it, because it's, uh, if you wear the wrong clothes, you'll probably die. Um, and it was a really transformative period of my life, um, in, a very, in, in a very embodied sense. So it's not that I sat there intellectualizing it. it w I, I actually was trying to make a film. I wasn't trying to write a book, and I failed to make a film. And so my book, in, in some ways, is a response to that. Um, so I'm going to read you a passage from a morning after a huge storm where I'd lain there all night, um, basically sheltering myself with my duvet, wor wondering if something was going to blow in through the window. After breakfast, I go out to the front step and inhale the sea air. It is tight in my nostrils, freezing the moisture within them, and it parches the back of my throat. 
The sea before me is flat, as if nothing ever happened. It is 11 a.m. and has only recently got light up there in the sky above. The valley floor where I stand remains steeped in indigo, the color of snow in shadow. Today, the yellow light of a still hidden sun will only creep a little way down the vertiginous slopes of the mountains that surround me. But the most important thing for me is that it exists at all, a promise of things to come. The raven preens himself, perched on the lamppost at the end of our drive. He is ragged and all silhouette against the blue. He contorts to put himself back together again after a rough night. I wonder where ravens go in storms like that. I smile, but it hurts my teeth to keep them exposed for too long, so I lick them with my warm tongue and make a mental note to remember to smile inwardly. The weather is too good to stay near the house, so I grab my oversized down coat, hat, gloves, and thermal wellies to head out into the snow, into the valley. Everything is hushed. The soles of my boots creak their tread into the blankness, and the sound is improbably loud for one woman's footsteps. Behind the house, I walk across the small meadow making the first trace of the day that will show the village my movements. I hear a sound from the raven like a pebble being thrown down a well, a sound I had never heard before coming here, but it has become a constant to my days. It seems to be made by his beak, but I have never been able to get close enough to see exactly how before he lifts off the fence, his glossy wings beating a slow feathered ululation. Plock, plock. It is loud, the only sound I can make out above the gently sighing sea. It echoes in this stillness, the cliffs playing with it. Echo, Bergmaul, the language of the mountain. The raven is probably hungry. The rock out front where we leave him, our lamb bones and fish skins, will be covered in snow after last night. These ravens who pass into and around and through my days have anchored me. They have been companions all winter, calling from the lamppost, squeaking the air with their flybys, asking of me a ritual that ties me into this place as I share my food with them, flesh, bones and skin. I have come to see their intelligence, their curiosity and playfulness. They come and go as they please, in pairs or solo, black shuttles on winter's loom. I don't know exactly how many there are, or really which is which. They are all raven, a diverse collective presence rather than individuals. It is only at the bend in the road on the way into Isafjordur that they gather in any number, at least where humans can see them. There, about 20 can often be found conferring with each other, a hrapnathink, a council of ravens. The same word can be used for a gathering of people. Raven, hrap, the word sounds like the bird's call when it greets a friend. According to the Bible, ravens have done their own thing since the great flood. Before he sent a dove, Noah sent a raven to see if there was dry land. But the raven did not return. He didn't need to. There would have been plenty of carrion in the flood water. All those beings who had not been selected to be saved by the ark. Perhaps he was not interested in being part of a narrative of exclusivity, instead busying himself transfiguring destruction into creation, death into life. From the kitchen window, I watched one tease a dog who was availing himself of my garden's facilities. The raven waddled towards the dog and took a peck at his tail, jumping aside as the dog snapped at it. Staring the dog in the eye, it waited until the very last moment to alight. I have even seen them skiing. Driving carefully along the coast road, I noticed that the steep snow-covered slope beside me was scored with two sets of thin parallel lines running down from the top of the ridge. No sooner had I silently wondered to myself what had caused these lines, a pair of ravens appeared on the ridge and slid deftly downhill. When they reached the road, they took off back to the top of the ridge to do it all over again. 
At the bottom of the meadow behind our house, there is a wooden sheep house that once belonged to the property. It is now owned by the town council, but our neighbor, Oliver, maintains it for them. In exchange, he uses it to store his tools. When I moved here, it was painted yellow with a red roof, but one day, last summer, I saw Oliver heading towards it with that bucket of gray ship paint that never seems to end, the same one Bocker, the previous owner of this house and his mother-in-law, had used all over our ground floor. He must have commandeered it when she moved out. As it is the view from my kitchen window, I could not bear the thought of losing even more color given how winter drains it from the landscape. I asked him if I could paint a mural on its large double doors. Bara ain't blom, just one flower, he said. His sister-in-law had overheard from her neighboring garden and told him to stop being so tight. So I painted a large trompe l'oeil of the valley in summer so that the village might always have a portal to that season with the sheep sorrel and the dandelions, the rushing river and the melted snow. When I had finished, the raven flew by in repeated loops from his perch on the fence at the front, round to the back of the house and past this mural over and over until he finally landed in front of it, looking up, taking it in like a guest at an exhibition preview. Thank you very much. <laughs> That was beautiful, thank you. And we'll pass right over to Esther. Thank you. I'm very pleased that you read a bit about, about ravens. That um, I don't know any ravens personally, but uh, they're from the family, the Corvid family, um, birds I know very well indeed. Um, I'm going to read from, from the, uh, the beginning of the book, this is, it really explains my, my view of other species and why I feel the way I do about them. A late October afternoon. It's quiet. The blue light of dusk beyond the windows melts into early darkness. I'm in the company of others, but I'm the only human being here. I'm walking from room to room, tidying, putting things in order, preparing for the evening when I notice a smur of shadow passing over the surface of the kitchen floor. It's faint, just an impression before a glance, a small wisp of something, of blown feather, a dust ball gusted in a draught. In these old houses, floors have weather of their own, breezes, cyclones, polar easterlies. I follow it closely until I see that it's walking minutely but steadily across the desert's expansive floor. A spider so tiny that she freezes me where I stand, hyper-aware suddenly of my feet, of my own power, my murderous boots. This is a fellow inhabitant of my house, brought in by the cold, the incessant rain. This spider is clearly heading somewhere, but I know I'll have to interrupt her journey in case, in doing other things, I forget she's there step on her and end her life. Keeping my eye on her, I tear a page from a small notepad and bend to urge her onto it, her own brilliant yellow magic spider carpet. Instead, she climbs onto my hand and walks about my fingers for a while until I encourage her onto the paper so that I can carry her to safety, away from me, her only obvious danger. As a representative of my species, by comparison with this creature, I'm huge. As a member of my species, I carry the inescapable burden of the long, egregious history of human dealings with the lives of others. As an individual, I'm guilty by deed and by association. An almost invisible spider faces me with myself. As I hold this other living being on a scrap of paper, I know that there isn't exactly a relationship between her and me, but a skin of connections which ties us both into the center of the questions that have been occupying my mind for a long time now. Ones I ask now of a member of an erect genus and family, I can't immediately identify. 
What are we doing here together? How, in the light of the hundreds of millions of years of our shared past, should I behave towards you and others? Thank you so much for that. So I wanted to start with something that I think came across from the passages both of you just read um, and is, is very significant throughout the, the, the works you've written, which is how you balance the sort of fine art of noticing and, and the specific encounter with a specific non-human animal with the legacies of cultural inheritances. And, and it's something I think both of you explore in very different ways. And I was wondering, just as writers, how you, how you think about hitting that balance between real living beings and centuries of cultural formation. Yeah, I, I think this experience in Iceland made me face up against quite a, quite a lot of that, of my cultural conditioning, especially with ravens. I, I realized very quickly that ravens are held in, well, simultaneously in high regard as being part of a mythological past um, and also a very sort of fond uh, relationship with ravens, but equally a kind of uh, one pitted against eider farmers, for example, because the, the, the ravens will take the eider eggs. And they are actually allowed to shoot ravens for when they're hustling the, the farmers. Um, but it was part of a, a wholesale transformation that happened to me, this, this cultural conditioning and realizing that my cultural conditioning just didn't apply. And so, that, so the book sort of shows the narrator going through that change. That's how I dealt with it. Yeah. Well, for me, I am... Um I describe it in my, my first book, Corvus. I was given a, a rook and brought this rook up until her, her sad death at the age of 31, just before lockdown. And just this experience of living closely with this bird and various other creatures brought me to a realization of really how, how very backward human attitudes are towards other species, how little we know, how little we are prepared to, to uh, concede to other species. And from there, I, in the writing of, of all these books, I, you know, f at first I found myself saying, well, we think of other species because of Aristotle or because of Augustine or, and it, explaining it in, in, in these ways. And I've, all, I've always wanted to investigate more why is this and what has made us see other species the way we do. And it's something that I explore in between night and storm. Where did our ideas come from? And also, is, has the time not come when we really have to change our ideas? Or you know, perhaps it's too late, I don't know. Thank you. And, and I, I really like that focus on the transformative encounter, either with a particular bird, with a particular country. You know, this idea that, that what both of you have done is take something that happened to you and, and transform it into, into the re readership. And in some ways, this is perhaps a slightly unfair question, but, but I'm interested. You know, there's a lot of nature writing out there right now. It, it, it is one of the growth genres. And I'm curious as to how, both how you place yourself within the, this tradition of, of contemporary nature writing, but also why you think there's such an appetite for it. What, what is it that books such as yours can do in the world? It, that's quite a difficult one um, because there are very different types. I've, I mean, I've been, uh, I think Corvus came out in 2008, so I've kind of watched, I mean, it was, on great, we, you know, it, it had begun. I mean, there were questions about, you know, about what it was and so on. There's quite in the, in the time since there's been quite a lot of, of um, writing about the land, which I tend not to write to, to do um, because you know I write about you know, philosophy and history and so on. But there's been that, and I, th I uh, that is I think a response to the the climate emergency and. The, the knowledge that the way we live and the way we eat and so on is, is 
very significant now in ways that we didn't anticipate. And I think that there's a lot of there's also a lot of personal writing, which um, there wasn't so much before. That's that's it has been quite a uh, a new area in the last few years, such as books such as Sarah's. Although, I, yeah, I would say, and this is maybe not going to be the answer you expect, but it's entirely by chance that I happen to have written a personal story that happens to be in a, a very naturey place. But I, I personally, um, I hadn't come from a literature background at all, so I'd been in anthropology and filmmaking, and so I was only sort of vaguely aware of this nature, um, nature writing phenomenon at the at the beginning of my time in Iceland, and. As I said, I wasn't planning to write a book, so it wasn't like I was following the genre and, and you know, I hadn't really, I hadn't even read Robert McFarlane by 2008 or something, you know. Um, but the, the way I've written the book is very sort of embodied and also quite filmic, I think, because that's the way that I was taking things in. So I, I, I kind of reached a point, it's more that I reached a point with anthropology where I was like, do you know what? I... I'm really struggling with this um, subject-object divide, both like within yeah. within the human population, but also othering uh, non-human yeah. animals. Um, and my response to that was then to write from life. Um, so it's it's actually coincidental that it happens to have fallen into a booming genre. But yeah, I agree that partly as a response to the climate emergency, people are beginning to. There's such unfathomably big sort of things happening to us and big concepts to get your ha head around that I think it, it does need to be brought down to the scale of the, the body and the home um, so that people can actually feel things because a lot of the language of the climate emergency is, is scientific and cold and it needs to be so for, for facts but not when it comes to getting people to care. Um, and I also think that after the lockdowns, um, a lot of people who were fortunate enough to, to, to be on furlough, for example, had the time to, to pay much closer attention to the natural world, and it's natural to want to, to continue that um, through literature now that we're all back to not very normal at all. <laughs> yeah. no, that, that's really interesting, and, and it actually ties into something that, that I wanted to ask you anyway, which, partly because I read the advanced reader copy of this, and then I went to Blackwell's, right over there, and, and I looked at it, and I was like, ooh, but there are photos, and they're beautiful, and I was not expecting that. And I, I was wondering, sir, if you could talk a bit more about moving between film and writing, and, and how that, that sort of shaped your practice. Yeah, I was it's very big shame you don't have the one with the pictures. And also, I wish I'd known I'd have put them up because they're, it's actually a, a kind of photo essay that runs through the book. Kind of, it's not illustrative, but the, the images speak to the text. And there's one of a seal really looking at you and that people are like, ooh. <laughs> and this is, not, this is not something that doesn't have agency. This is not like, oh, isn't that a nice picture of a seal? It's like, aha, uh -huh. there's a whole... Umwelt of that seal. And then there's another picture of a seal. Have a flick through at the end. There's another picture of the seal being bottle fed by my, my ex's, my ex mother in law, with my ex as a baby lying next to the seal on the floor. So it's like the seal's there looking at you, and the seal's there as part of a, a life world of people living in, in very sort of close proximity and continuum with, with the natural world. Um, but in terms of. Yeah, moving between images and text. I actually think that I think that writing is a visual art. I, I just, uh, for me, I don't understand this. Uh, if you if you write well, people see images. Um, so I, I wish that you know there was a bit more pooling of that instead of you know separate pots of funding, and because then there would be a bit more dialogue between them. Um, but people have said, because I did a reading yesterday and a storyteller was present, he said, you know, when you, when you pause the image, the image continues, but when you pause sound, it's silent. And so it's a way of like layering. And I, and I think I have been really influenced by um, st a storytelling mode as well, because it's a very oral kind of culture. And um, not just in terms of like, relating stories and the sagas being part of Icelanders' history, but in terms of like the storiedness of life and also the way in which the day's events are related. Because when you live in rural places, it's actually a, it's a it makes you popular if you're a good good storyteller. Um, but what I noticed, at least within the family that I was part of, also that sometimes they would make decisions 
on a journey, for example, that would make the best story, not that was the safest way to go. But it's like, oh, if we, if we went over that mountain pass that says it's closed at the moment, you know. <laughs> um, so I think that I, I really took that on board because I was learning Icelandic at the, at the time. And before I could understand what the words meant, I, I was much more tuned into the cadence and I, I could tell, oh, this is storytelling mode now. So I wanted to bring that into the language. I wanted to sort of reanimate the language to be, yeah, to be that storytelling mode that involves the body. Yeah. That's absolutely fascinating. And, and Esther, it's, it's kind of a similar question for you, but you know, with, with this book, you've sort of done a much more visibly research-oriented approach. Yeah. Um, and in some ways, because I knew before I read it going in, and then I, I was just so struck with, with these incredibly po poetic images. And I'm just wondering, you know, when you were doing the research for this and reading centuries of cruelty, you know, <laughs> how, how you were able to find ways of writing about it poetically? I don't know. I mean, it's just, <laughs> just the, the um, to say it's just the way I write it sounds, it sounds very kind of inglorious. But it was, I mean, it, it actually was very difficult because the subjects that I chose, which are things like hunting and animal experimentation and um, one chapter is called Blood, it's about um, meat and food and um, I deal with, for instance, the fur trade and it was excruciatingly difficult. And trying to, trying to write in a way that doesn't turn people off and isn't shocking and isn't, but, but has an impact it's quite difficult, and, and as I say, it certainly did have an impact by the end of it. Um, I don't know if it, you know, if one is writing for anything, it is to try and change people's view. I mean, it, that sounds very, very arrogant, but you know, if you can, in even the smallest ways, I mean, I'm, you know, in writing about COVIDs, you know, a lot of people say, in fact, I remember when I was writing um, the, my Corvus. I bumped into somebody who said, oh, what's he doing? And I said, oh, I'm writing a book about crows. And she said, ugh, horrible birds. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's, you know, kind of strange response. And in the way I wrote about, you know, I was writing a personal story. I'd like to, th I mean, you know, people have said, oh, well, I look at crows in a different way. And that's, you know, that's, that's the purpose of it, really. Did you dedicate it to her? I dedicated the last book to... <laughs> to chick it, my, my, my rook was called chick it. Oh, 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 to the, to the, to the woman the who didn't like oh, oh, no, that's right. No, no, I, I dedicated the last, my last book to my, my, my dear rook. <laughs> I want to come back to Corvids in just a moment, but, but I wanted to pick up on something you said that, that again ties your two books together, which is both of you right at the end of the books point towards the future. And because we've been talking about climate emergency and all sorts of, of horrible things, I'm sort of wondering how you think, you know, either, either in a fanciful universal way or in a much more specific way about your writing, you know, how, how, does, how do you see your writing as opening up spaces for a better future in these ways? We, we were just having that chat up we, in the we, green room. We, 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 <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah. I mean, I, I think something useful that Iceland taught me was how we just, we just don't know what's going to happen. And so it's, it's more about becoming limber at living with uncertainty and the writing perhaps helping in that process. Um, and that, that is quite a lot of, that's one of the major threads of, of this narrative. But one of the most um, direct things I'm doing at the moment is not so much with the writing itself, but kind of, but I'm, I'm doing readings around the country um, in an Icelandic tradition of Kvaldvaka, which is called the, the evening wake, and it's something you do in the autumn and winter, where people would come in 
as the, as the day was drawing in from the farm work and continue the very essential work of carding and spinning and knitting and darning um, because they had to maintain their own clothing. And also it's sort of tradition to give someone a, a new item of clothing for Christmas, so that would start in the autumn. But I think a most fundamental human thing is to hear a story whilst doing something with your hands. And it's having a very profound effect on people's nervous systems. You know, they're going, oh my gosh, I haven't been read to for since I was a child. And it, because this place that, I, that my book is a love letter to, it, it gave me the space to be able to think my own thoughts and think differently. And it strikes me very strongly when I'm back in the UK how policed and, and managed my thoughts are. And so if I can transport people for an hour into that space where they might feel deeply human, be together, have their own thoughts and get their socks mended, I mean, what's not to like? <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, I mean, it, it's obviously a very difficult moment from many points of view um, in politics, but I find it very difficult to separate the idea of our, our, the way we treat and the way we deal with, with other species um, without thinking about the politics of it. And that's something that I think about more and more, the, the fact that there is a divide and I... I, I it's, it's kind of, you know, obvious you think people just think a certain way and you know, lack empathy or whatever, look at animals in a, in a, a particular way. And it, that always seems to me a subject that is very well worth researching more. I mean, looking at the day-to-day -day effects, you will see people's attitudes towards gulls, say, or magpies or whatever, very much dictated by the newspapers they read that have certain attitudes and why is this and what is it I, in fact Sarah and I were just talking about this I was saying I think that, that one of the things that we are going to see very soon is um, revoking of the ban on fox hunting which is you know of course going to be a but that you know that that is is something that I'm sure is going to happen and I you know I just wish I could find ways of seeing some sort of progress in, in attitudes and you know the, the only thing one can do is to try and explore and, and um, write about what, what one can. Thank you for that. And I, I have, well, I have many more questions, but I, I, I'm aware that many of you will have questions as well. So I'm just going to ask one more question of you both, and then I'll open the floor to, to everyone else, um, which is a very simple one, which is that, that we, we have ravens on one side and we have crows on the other. Um, and, and I'm just interested, I mean, I think we all, I, I would love to spend the next 20 minutes telling my stories of you know, encounters with corvids, but I'm interested in, in what it is about corvids that makes them so, and so integrated into storytelling. Like I, I feel that that more than many other species, corvids demand stories. And I'm just wondering how how you approach that in in your your different ways. Well, I mean, the, what most when I first got came by um, the rook, I mean, I really didn't know anything very much. You know, took this creature in, and it was. Her insistence on being a person and being unintelligent and having agency and making it clear where... I mean, she was, yeah, she was a fledgling when we got her. And this, I mean, I've, I've still got a, a crow and I, I had a, a magpie for a long time. And they have this way of asserting personality, of finding their, their place in, in a family. And looking at, at it, it's because they come from large assemblages and have to negotiate their way socially. And when you look back and see the creation stories about Raven and so on, you can see how they came about because you have these, you know, extraordinarily intelligent creatures um, setting the agenda, I think. I mean, I don't have nearly such a proximal relationship with ravens as you've had, like that these ravens never came in my house. Um, and they would I'd never try and make a raven into a pet. You know, they are their own thing out there on the lamppost being, being cheeky in a really beautiful way. Um, and I, I, I think for me, uh, there was definitely a personal resonance. Like I, I feel like we, we share some traits. Um, so maybe I identified a little bit. But in terms of storytelling i think it's because they speak to so many 
um, of our traits as well that we can identify. And by that, it's not necessarily the same as anthropomorphism. It's more like identifying with Raven's characteristics. And they, they also, with Raven, um, they make pair bonds for life and they can be very affectionate, they, they're very loyal, and they also remember um, if someone's been unkind. Um, so all of those things definitely are very, um, very sort of interesting attributes for a protagonist in a, in a story. But also they've lived alongside, you know, they're, they're very sociable as well. They live alongside humans, so it's only natural that, and, and they have such beautiful vocalizations. I think it's only natural they've made it into story because they're so multifaceted. Yeah. Did you ever see an example of the the man being t ticking against somebody? Well, taking against my neighbour's dog. Yes. All oh, right. Yeah. 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 Because they, I mean, you know, you do not cross a, a, a corvid without consequence. I mean, but it, you it just did. Don't. It did feel as if because I had had a go at that yep. neighbour because it would just basically bring its dog onto my lawn yep. and let it do its business there. And it, just because it was like an open field doesn't mean it's an open toilet. And so maybe this raven had seen me yeah. going up and having a word. Yeah. But, there, but then it was as if he was my representative. I don't want to project, but it felt yeah, like yeah. that for a moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah they, they bear grudges in, in a, a very spectacular way. <laughs> <laughs> so I do want to open the floor to questions. Um, there is a roving microphone, which is somewhere. Uh, over there. So, so yes, I'd welcome any questions. So in the second row there. Okay, um, now your raven, it, it obviously eats meat, I assume, and or they're cl cleaning up carrion. Um, does, it, it's the reason why it, it was competition for the dog, because the, the dog would do the same. It, the, the reason why they like uh, ravens in Iceland, isn't it, to clear up all the, the dead as such? Because uh, uh, it would help, because it's very difficult to bury things and in the ice. And yeah, but they, they, they still do. Ravens are very much that. Yeah. They're, they're Did you like bring a... that out in the book? I was just wondering. Um... Well, I don't agree that it was competition for the dog. I don't think he was attacking the dog for that reason. I think it was actually like teasing the dog. I mean, they're known to tease dogs. That was just for fun. It wasn't like, oh, you're going to eat some meat that I would otherwise have. Um, and, and also the, the meat, the place where I left the meat was, was his rock and he'd be very territorial about that. So there's no chance the dog would get to go anywhere near. Um, but are they, are they useful for, yeah, for, for decomposing carrion? For, for sure, yeah. Um, it's not something I particularly talk about, but um, obviously it's, it's frozen for eight months a year. Things take a while to decompose, but, and, and they're one of the only birds that stays around. You've got the falcon as well in the wintertime, um, but no, it's not something I particularly talk about, but not because it's not true. <laughs> there was a question in the back over there, but I didn't see which hand it was, but I did see a hand towards the back. No one will own up to it. Are there other questions? Yes, in the front second right there. I haven't read either book yet, although I will, I promise. <laughs> um, but do you, um, either of you, talk anywhere about the the kind of literary background? When, when, when when you were talking just now, I was thinking of the raven in particular as the beast of battle, as it crops up in Icelandic and Old English poetry, the, you know, the, the carrion bird. Um, how, do, do you, how do you feel about the, the literary personifications that have been sometimes imposed on, on creatures like the raven or Br'er Fox? As, as a, a bad omen, you mean, that sort of thing, yeah. I mean, I, I do, like, I take the encounters with Raven and then sort of muse on it. So it's not, my, my book's definitely not one that sort of refers back to, to various lit, literary sources, like yours yeah. is a much more research kind of text. But I do talk about how um, 
I've just sort of received this sense of, of ravens and, and corvids in general being bad omens, and then suddenly I'm faced with something different, and um, wonder aloud whether that that sort of bad reputation followed actually the development of civilization, where you know battlefields were the result of conquest, and so that's what they were they were seen pecking out the eyes of the dead. But that's rather unfair because like the, the actual the, the deaths were caused by humans. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, that's something that I do quite a lot throughout uh, uh, my work, is look at the literary background, often to challenge what has been said. Um, and, I mean, you know, not just with, with Corvids, it's with, with all, every species that, you know, that I, I deal with. Um, because, yeah, I mean, there's just such a, an amazing wealth of... of um, of reference, a, a lot to Corvids, and as Sarah says, it's because of, you know, a lot of that is because of their reputation. After the Great Fire, they, they gained a particularly nasty reputation. Well, what else? That is, that is what they do. You know, this, is, this is the thing that, that um, is always interesting, that people are, you know, people shock at a species doing what it does. In, in older mythologies, they're also known to be, you know, they, they transfigure that death into life. And so actually my, yeah, my dedication in my book is to the ravens for making, unmaking and remaking the world. There's this constant cycle. Um, I, I, I believe there's archaeological evidence that in Neolithic Orkney they were harness to clean the dead that the bones that are yeah. found in the chamber yeah. tombs have been exposed and and cleaned by birds yes. because the you know if they had been cleaned by animals there would have been teeth marks and so forth there's nothing like that but they've obviously been cleaned and the, like yeah. the small finger bones are missing the things that a bird could take yeah. away that's right and there's i mean there's obviously you know quite a, you know worldwide um tradition of that in you know, the towers of silence and, and so on one thing I wanted to ask while the audience is, is thinking is, we, we've been talking a lot about non-human animals, but, but you know, one of the things that distinguishes your work a lot is, is a love of place and the people in it as well, well, well as the, the non-human animals. And I, I wondered both sort of how writing about Iceland and writing about Aberdeen has anchored your work, but also as you have both sort of read elsewhere, how audiences not from Iceland or not from Aberdeen respond to that? And do they say, oh, this is a universal truth? Or, oh, that is just an Icelandic thing. That is just an Aberdonian thing. And, and sort of that, that movement between the very specific places that you evoke so well and, and something more global. Um, well, I, I think the point of story is to evoke something more if not global, at least universal, you know, something that's kind of eternal. But my experience of Iceland was partly, and partly the reason I sort of had to write about it, was it seemed to be a sort of petri dish for existence in a way. You know, anything that happened in Iceland could happen anywhere, but because it's, uh, it's not empty, I don't want to say it's empty at all, it's very, it's populated, but because the, the layers of man-made stuff are so few, it was much more easy and uh, for me to witness the direct cause and effect of things, and that's what was so transformative. So I feel that the themes that I explore could apply to anywhere, whilst at the same time, people have reported that they do feel transported there even if they haven't been there. And also in the past 10 years, a lot of people have been to Iceland that hadn't been 10 years ago. You know, it suddenly became a place on the map uh, for, for maybe the wrong reasons because of the financial crisis and then the volcano that <laughs> that one um, so I think it sort of went from being somewhere that if I'd written this 10 years ago it would be an otherworldly place that people are imagining now people have real experiences to hitch onto that so it sort of has that other resonance yeah well I mean I write about um Aberdeen, because I live here, and because one of my things is is the the, the idea of the, the sort of Taoist idea of 
place and being in a place observing and the, in, in, in Taoism there's an idea that you should have seen the smoke of the next village but never have been there which is a lovely idea particularly you know, when you're thinking about the environmental cost of travel and all the rest of it so to be centred in a place and I mean obviously I'm you know, not, quite a, not quite as small as that but being centred in a place and observing it from every point of view is it's, you know, it's, it, it's a, a, a very sort of expansive way of looking at things, contrarily. Absolutely. We have time for one more question, if anyone has anything they've been wanting to ask. In which case, I, I will ask one last question and then we'll move over. And, and it, it, I'm not sure it's the best question to end on, but, but it's, it's one I'm really interested in, which is one of the things that you see a lot, not just in nature writing broadly, place writing, um, is, is this question of how to balance the sentimental and perhaps the cynical. And, you know, one of, one of the things I like about your, 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 all of your works is, is that they are deeply felt, but, but I would certainly call them unsentimental, that, that there, there is a rigor that, that underpins them. And I'm wondering sort of if that is both in your writing but also in your reading or, or your watching, how you, you try to invite the reader in and, and m make them not give in to despair or anything like that, but, but also you know, speak a certain sort of truth. So, so yeah, I guess the question is really sentimentality and cynicism and, and how you might want to balance those. I think I came up against the question of what, what truth really was. I don't mean in a sort of post-Trump way. I mean, I, I was challenged on a daily basis about my, my preconceptions. And so I approached it by taking the reader on that journey with me where I'm asking a lot of questions and not necessarily finding any easy answers to those questions. So that, that allows you to simultaneously to be... I mean, a lot of the time I'm in love but I, with the place and with people, um, but I wouldn't call it sentimental as such. You know, love is a, is a powerful force, and I acknowledge that. Um, but equally, you know, being willing to be slightly cringeworthy, you know, that's, that's my 28-year-old self. That When I was writing it, it's 10 years on, so I had to still find that, that person, that narrator, who didn't know. And I suppose that allows the reader to come on that journey with you because you're not, you're not there as some expert who knows. Um, yeah, so it's to be okay with, with not knowing. Yeah. Well, I find that observing uh, other species and, I mean, rats, you know, I really had pet rats for a long time, and observing them and the corvids and, and whatever else. If you're accepting of the idea that what they do is what they do and without judgment, but at the same time open the possibility yourself to the possibility of their having feelings and very similar ones and, and so on, then you can't, you can't be cynical and you have to, it, it gives you a sense of equality in the world, which really is, is the only hopeful thing, I think. It's an excellent note to end on. So like I say, this ends this portion, but you're not allowed to go anywhere. Uh, <laughs> but first, before I get into anything else, please join me in thanking Esther and Sarah for a really interesting conversation. <laughs>
is standing there with a whole bunch of um, Nan Shepard books. I do want to specify that the prize is not simply a Nan Shepard book, that they actually get large sums of cash. Yes. So if you know <laughs> any S5 or S6 students in the local um, councils, please do send them our way. We will be launching our new competition in the immediate future. There are flyers next to Greg at the bookstall. But Helen, I'm going to turn to you. Thank you. I think we should also thank Tim Baker, who's been on this stage quite a lot, working very hard this week. So a big round of applause for Tim Baker. <laughs> And the wonderful Leslie Crera, because she's been working extremely hard too. <laughs> and we always embarrass her by, by being more and more complimentary at the end of every single one. The superlative, the extraordinary, the fantastic Leslie Crera. But yes, so it's very nice to be able to announce the winners of this prize. I'm not sure how we worked the logistics of this exactly, because they are, they are in the audience, aren't they? Are there three, all three of you in the audience? I, I've spotted two. I'm not sure if all three are in the audience. So yes, we have we have paid them the large cash sums. So they have. They don't worry. They're not just getting copies of the quarry wood. We were also thinking of giving them a Nan Shepherd fiver, which we thought would be quite nice. But we couldn't find three. I, <laughs> so, so so what we're going to do is I don't know if you're happy to come up on the stage and receive these, and then what we'll do is when. Um, uh, you can come over and speak to, to Sarah and Esther, and they're going to go and sign books at the back, and they will they will inscribe yours for you as well. So that will be almost as good as a Nan Shepherd Fiver. That's the, <laughs> the idea. But yeah, the, the prize this year. So we, we we run it every year, and well, for three years we've run it. And there's a, there's a theme, and you, people people enter. The, the, it should say on there when the closing date is. Tim, we usually do a we. Um, there we go. So yes, you just, you just, but you, any, you can submit anything you like inspired by Nan Shepherd with the theme that we name on there. I think it's place and belonging, yes. Um, and we sometimes do it, well, sometimes, we've always done a little um, sort of workshop in the run up to it so that people come along and do, do talk a bit about Nan Shepherd and the way that she writes and the ways that it might transfer into the way that you write and things like this. So that's, that's, for anyone out there who knows any 16 to 18-year-olds 18 year who might be interested or who's at all associated with any schools, um, we have actually sent these to all the schools. Um, and we also have some very nice Nan Shepherd posters if anyone wants to take them and put them somewhere. But in the meantime, I would like to invite onto the stage if they're happy to get on the stage. <laughs> do you want to get on the stage or do you just want to stand up and have loads and loads of claps? I mean, you can get up and we'll just give it to you and you can just sort of, <laughs> we're not going to make you bow or read your workout. Which would you prefer? Because I didn't manage to ask you beforehand. You really don't mind. Okay, then you're on the stage. <laughs> If you don't mind, you're on the stage, folks. Okay, so I, we, 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 every year we, 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 are we giving, I'm giving these in, in alphabetical order, so you have no idea whether we, you know, we have, we have a first prize and two runners-up prizes, but sometimes we give two first prizes and a runner-up prize, and sometimes we give three first prizes, and we're not telling you which. And they're in alphabetical order, and they are. <laughs> Ira Ahmed. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> And Zoe Conroy. <laughs> and Holly Dunlop. Okay, so I have to... I think we should give everybody on stage another big round of applause because it was a really fantastic final in-person event for this festival. Thanks again to Sarah and Esther for a beautifully nuanced and, you know, fascinating talk, which is totally in, this, in the tradition of Nan Shepherd. Thank you very much. And come next year. 